this little group of ooh, <laughs> perfect timing. This little group of items uh, came from uh, another estate sale that I that I went to in this last month. Uh, and this is from the estate of uh, Hans Dreyer, and uh, he passed away. Uh, Oh, I don't know, a year or so ago, maybe a little bit more. And he lived in a couple towns over. Um, never met the guy, um, but I was contacted by um, uh, a friend of the family that uh, uh, was charged with uh, clearing out his uh, the property, uh, some old cars and the shop and uh, a few other things. Anyway, so we went and uh, took a look at some stuff. And anyway, I came away with a few things uh, of interest here. Um, so Hans uh, uh, did work for uh, the physics uh, department at uh, a couple of national laboratories and uh, so he built a little product in his shop and uh, it's not quite clear what it was that he was building. I think some of it was, I would kind of characterize as sensitive. So uh, the fact that uh, um, somebody from one of the national labs came and picked some stuff up uh, uh, was kind of... Uh, uh, <laughs> kind of interesting, actually. But anyway, let's uh, let's take a look at some stuff that uh, that I got at that uh, that estate sale and check out some things that uh, that Hans actually made uh, that are pretty cool, and we can talk about those and uh, kind of pay our respects to Hans and uh, some of the cool goodies he uh, he left behind. All right, this one comes to us from the uh, the estate of uh, Hans Dreyer. Uh, friend of mine told me about this uh, particular estate sale and we got to go take a look at it and I ended up getting a few things from it. Um, this was something that uh, that appealed to me. It's, I believe it's an apprentice project or an early career project that uh, uh, this guy Hans uh, did uh, when he was when he was learning the trade. You know there's some kind of indicators on here that uh, make me think that this is kind of an early project for this gentleman. Uh, seeing some of the high class work that he was doing in his own shop um, leads me to believe that this was kind of an early uh, an early thing. Um, anyway, he's got his initials in it, and uh, I've said it before, but I always like to have something that's uh, got the person's name in it, so I have a, a connection, and I can kind of remember and think about them when I'm when I'm using the thing. Now, this one's interesting. Um, it's got a couple interesting features uh, that I don't have in any of the other angle plates that I have. It's got a little step here, uh, which is nice for if you got a <clears throat> something thin to put on there. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you can uh, rest it on that edge. Same thing over here. Uh, and then you can you know you can clamp to it here or clamp to it from the back or whatever. And then this one has a a, a big V cut through the middle of it. Now that must have been heck. Uh, in fact, you can you can see a little bit here uh, where it didn't quite clean up on the grinder. Um, what probably happened is cutting that big V in there, this thing kind of distorted and heat treat a little bit. I don't know what kind of steel this is, um, but it's hard. It's hard as a monkey's uncle, and um, so um, um, so I imagine that uh, this thing uh, moved around a little bit uh, in heat treat. So. Uh, but anyway, uh, Hans, thank you very much for uh, for leaving this behind for us, and uh, I uh, uh, I certainly appreciate it, and uh, we'll we'll put it to good use and uh, in, around the shop. Now I have more from uh, from this estate to show you guys. Um, this was kind of a, an interesting uh, guy. He did a lot of work for the uh, um, scientific community, uh, in particular physics projects and things like that. And uh, so we have some other stuff to look at from the estate of Hans Dreyer. Well, let's take a look at this thing first. Um, this is a, an attachment or an accessory for a surface grinder and uh, it allows you to do rotary grinding on a uh, kind of a normal surface grinder. Um, so this one's interesting in that it's uh, it has a built-in little gear motor in it and um, um, so the idea here is that you can um, well, you can put a part up here and then position the surface grinding wheel here and you can rotate the part and grind um, well something maybe like this tabletop here for example in fact uh, maybe this was done on that so you'd start here and then you would just traverse in one 
one axis this way, okay, while this rotates under under the surface grinding wheel. So uh, it has the ability to produce really flat parts, uh, which is one of its uh, kind of neat things about it. Um, it also has an indexing feature here, and you can see the notches on the outside. Um, let's let it index. Click. Okay. So you can do uh, any num a few different uh, direct indexing on it, um, or you can turn it on and spin grind basically, um, and it has a speed control here, so you can go pretty, pretty, pretty zippy, yeah, or pretty slow. I think I don't know, quite the minimum speed. Yeah, it's pretty slow. Yeah, about there. A little drag on it. You need a little more than that. So I put a new cord on it. it uh, the cord was sick and kind of crispy. Oh, uh, and the other thing is uh, you can change directions too um, with it. Now the way these are set up, um, they have a uh, there's a series of balls that run on the uh, underside of this plate, and they run in a little V groove, uh, a ground V groove, and it has a uh, a center preloaded ball bearing um, support and uh, some folks that uh, actually you know I didn't I didn't put any pictures up of that so never mind um, and then underneath it has another thrust bearing that preloads a whole assembly vertically um, so it's pretty rigid uh, pretty rigid assembly um, this it has a foot so we could actually stand it up and put it on this surface here uh, and grind uh, the periphery of something as well so uh, um, it weighs a ton, yes. It, it's heavy, it looks heavy, and it is heavy. So we'll be playing around with that on the, um, this is a little bit big for the Taft Pierce grinder, but this will go nicely on the, on the Brown and Sharp uh, MicroMaster. So we'll be doing some, uh, some rotary grinding with this. Um, the other thing people do here is they mount um, a, uh, let's see if I can grab one real quick. Yep. They, you can mount a small uh, uh, magnetic chuck on here to, to hold thin parts as well. Um, this one's a, <laughs> this is a little small for this one here, but uh, um, you know, if you have a small part, that would be fine. Um, or you could probably uh, just mount a rectangular chuck on here too if you wanted to. Um, so any number of things, or just bolt the part directly on there. So anyway, uh, you could do use this on the mill, okay? Uh, to cut circles and arcs and things like that. Although it does not have any kind of uh, angular, other than the notches, it doesn't have any angular, um, you can't take measurements angularly with it, other than the indexing. So, uh, so like if you wanted to do an arc of a particular number of degrees or something, uh, it would be hard to do. So these guys are kind of history, Roto-Grind and m and tool. They're no more. Um, these come up for sale on the used market occasionally, and um, um, and uh, so they're they're kind of around, and it's kind of a weird bird. So, uh, but anyway, I was sitting on the floor covered in uh, sawdust and chips and stuff, and uh, um, I, I when I first looked at it, I just thought it was a rotary table and didn't really give it much much thought. Then uh, I noticed the cord sticking out of it, and I went, what the heck is that? So anyway, dusted it off and looked at it, and I said, oh, okay, and stuck it in my stack, and uh, it came home with me. So, so Hans, thank you very much uh, for buying a really nice tool, and uh, we'll put it, to, put it to good use around here. All right, so this next one's pretty cool. I was, I was, uh, I've always wanted one of these uh, and, you know, had light need for one but uh, this never really kind of got off my rear end to buy one um, so anyway I found one finally and this came from the Hans Dreyer estate and it's a little it's a little scroll chuck three jaw with a, a neuraled uh, actuation ring here or a neuraled tightening ring which is kind of nice it doesn't need a key or anything and this is on a 5c shank and I think he made this this particular 5C shank, so uh, um, it looks homemade and it doesn't go all the way through, uh, which is not a big deal because uh, the stuff that you'd be doing in this is just going to be little little short stuff. Now, you know, one of the problems that I have is that 
my big forge, the big forge I have on the Yam lathe, uh, it only closes down to about three quarters of an inch. And um, so if I got something to do that's a little bit smaller than that, um, you know, I got to I got to horse around a little bit to do it. And what you can do with this, it's kind of neat, is obviously if you have a machine that's set up with a 5C collet nose, you can plug that in there and then um, you can chuck stuff of uh, some different diameters. And these jaws are reversible too, so you can grab on the outside. But on my big four jaw, what I can do is I can stuff this in a, I can stuff it in a, uh, in a block if I can find the key. Um, and, um, and snug it down in there like that. And then that will pop, that will go in the four jaw. And, uh, and now I can do, uh, I can do stuff down to, oh, I don't know, that looks pretty small. I could probably hold a, uh, a millimeter or so, or maybe a little bit more, um, millimeter and a half, something like that. So pretty small. So now you can use your big monster lathe that uh, doesn't lend itself to a little tiny work uh, for a little tiny work. So uh, uh, now we don't have a good RPM on that. That thing only goes up to uh, 1800 or something like that. So we're at a disadvantage speed wise, but uh, that gives you an option. And then, you know, you can index. It's just a, just a useful piece if you're doing small, uh, small parts. So. Anyway, that's a little 5C uh, scroll chuck. This is uh, an example of a, a more recent uh, piece of work from uh, Hans Dreyer. Um, what this is, uh, it's kind of kind of cool. And uh, I walked by it in the shop and I looked at it and I go, oh, gee, I think I know what that is. And um, I went and looked at it and sure enough. So I put it in my, <clears throat> put it in my pile and I grabbed it. What it is, is it's a, it's a fixture for sharpening the uh, the, the end um, cutting edges of end mills. Um, so the the part that's down, you know, the, the part that cuts the floor, right? Um, and what it is is it's a it's a little indexing fixture. And if we loosen this up, then we can rotate it. Um, this is an in, a carrier for uh, the end mill. Um, I didn't, you know, I have to make some more adapters uh, for different sizes because this one, this is this three quarter shank here. Um, and um, what he's done is uh, marked these flats, these index flats, with the different combinations of, uh, of, of flutes, right? So this one will do a two, a three, or a, a four flute. Okay, four flute, three flute. So it's got some different index uh, positions here. So this will do anything from two to uh, four flutes here. Is that right? Yeah, that's, I think that's it, yeah. Um, and what he's done is he's built all the relief uh, angles into the fixture here. So we have a relief here, and then you can see there's a relief there, that uh, that angle there, and um, and then the, what it actually sits on here, these these rails here. So it's kind of neat. Um, so let's uh, what I got is I got a I got a two flute, big fat two flute here. So it's easy to kind of see what um, uh, what the different reliefs angles are on this. Now this this particular end mill wasn't ground on this fixture so the angles are subtly different and uh, but I think you guys will get the uh, um, you'll get the idea. So let's uh, let's set this up and um, and uh, and uh, go put it on the surface grinder and you guys can kind of see what uh, what we're talking about here. So let me put this in here and then uh, the next step here is to uh, we have to align these flutes with one of the index marks here, so uh, let's go do that. All right, first step is we're gonna we got a two flute end mill, so we're gonna set it on one of the uh, um, one of the two flute index marks. There'll be another one over here, and then we're gonna put this in like so. And this thing this thing fits so good. Look at that. Quite the uh, the nice fit. In fact, it could really use a vent hole. All right, push that down. And so for this step, what we want to do is is we want to orient this, you know, at perpendicular to some reference side here. Uh, one of these reference sides, I should say. So what we're going to do is we'll just stand it up on edge like so, and we're just going to use a uh, uh, we'll just use a square here. Make sure I'm yeah I'm in the 
frame okay. So we're just going to use a square here and I don't want to put my big fat bald head in the uh, in the uh, in the frame there. So I'm just going to get it kind of close. I'm not going for uh All right, so now I can lock lock that down. Okay. So now what we have here, so this is our first uh this is our first cutting edge angle here. Um, and it would be on this side here. So now if we put this on the surface grinder and we align this with the axis of the machine, this side here, we can grind this primary cutting edge right here, um, this, this land that you see right here. Um, and then, we loosen that, spin that around, go to the second index, and there it's dropping in, and then we can grind that one. <coughs> Excuse me, gosh. And then, um, <clears throat> gosh, I got something in my throat there. And then this angle here, and we'll, and we'll go show this on the surface grinder too, so you kind of get an idea about that. Um, this this relief angle back here, that's this right here. And you got to do a little bit of monkey business here because of the way he built this thing. Um, but uh, and then that gets that uh, that relief angle there. So once again, this is just for grinding the ends. It doesn't do anything about the sides. You need a um, a a helical fixture for that to do that so uh, but anyway let's go over on the surface grinder now that we got that set and we'll kind of set it up and you can kind of see the uh, see what that looks like so for our first uh, <clears throat> so for our first trick <laughs> um, so in this situation here we're gonna grind this uh, this lip here um, I suppose I could have turned it the other the other way and um, um, set it up the other way. Well, no, you can't really do that. That doesn't work. So it's always on this side. I guess you could, I could spin it around like that. Yeah, I'm gonna do it this way just because I'm thinking about it like that right now. So what you do is you'd align this with the fence here. I don't have a fence on this chuck here, but, but I think you guys can visualize that. We'll just uh, um, pretend that we're aligning with that, okay? so. Now I'm rolling right out of the frame. Okay, forget it. All right, so that's our first angle there. Boom, lock it down. Okay, bzz, 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 grind that, all right. Index, grind the other one so they're at the same height, right? Uh, and then after that, after we got those and they're nice and uh, crispy sharp and all that, what we can do is kind of set up for our next angle here, right? Now in this case, I mentioned it before, the way he built this, uh, you got to do some... Um, you got to do some monkey business here to uh, to make this kind of work. So we'll do that. And once again, you keep it perpendicular with the world there. And now this isn't a this isn't a great grip right here through these transfer blocks. So I would back it up with and uh, let's let me release this for a sec. I would back it up with something like this under here just to for a little extra. A little extra support there okay anyway you kind of get the idea right so now we're not locked very good at all oh, okay so that would make a difference there to shoulder up against that now unfortunately you can't stuff okay there we go that's better all right much better so I got these up against the shoulder these are transferring some to the fixture and then this is helping support it now keep in mind we're just typically these angles are already established so you're not it's not like you're plowing uh, tons of material off okay so uh, um, so that gets this relief angle the secondary relief and then rinse and repeat here like so now it's a little the the whole setup's a little different when you have a um, um, when you have you know something like four or five actually uh, let's grab a four flute and we'll take a look at a four flute um, so where the how you can get access to these um, secondary reliefs is a little different depending on the number of flutes because everything starts to get crowded uh, so let's take a look at that all right here's a here's a four flute and uh, and then a little pointer here. Here's the, uh, the the secondary relief angle that we're we're talking about here. But when you're when you're so four is not bad, right? So the wheel can come across here, and 
um, and clear that material away without catching this other flute. But when you get into something like this, right, okay, you can see that uh, that's dead nuts in the way of that. So you have to kind of clock them at an angle. In fact, if you look at the grind lines, they came across this way here, more parallel uh, with the, the next flute to do that secondary relief angle. So, you know, it's all kind of academic, but uh, it's just something to be aware of. Two is about as easy as it gets. So, um, you know, if you want to practice or whatever uh, with something like this, um, uh, start with two flutes because they're pretty easy. Um, what was I going to say? You know, a lot of guys just, uh, they sell a little fixture like this, a little end mill relief fixture, uh, and they're not particularly expensive. And I don't remember what they have to hold the shanks, if it's bushings or if it uses 5C collets or what does it use. Um, I can't remember. But uh, this guy Hans decided to, to make this uh, a pretty nice little fixture here. And uh, so uh, we'll try it out at some point and, uh, and uh, sharpen up some end mill uh, ends there. So, All right, this one's for our friend uh, Stan Zinkowski at uh, Barzy Industrial. Um, if you haven't checked out uh, Stan's channel, uh, you should check it out. And that's where you get uh, updates on the, uh, the summer bash. So here's the, uh, um, the uh, 2019 summer bash uh, uh, hashtag. So this is the, uh, the theme of uh, the 2019 um, summer bash uh, when hell freezes over. But anyway, Stan, um, interestingly enough, bought a... Uh, a 55 gallon drum full of surgical instruments from a from a company and uh, you know he's been parsing them out he grabbed a bunch of stuff for himself and and he's been giving away you know tweezers and uh, hemostats and all kinds of stuff but there's a pile of these in there and he was like well, what the hell are these damn things right and uh, I said Stan those are scalpel holders and he goes what and anyway so uh, I figured I'd uh, I'd show him since scalpels are um, uh, it's actually a really useful tool in the shop for deburring and cutting uh, operations, and uh, I my feeling is that they're uh, they're much superior to uh, you know, your cheapo uh, you know standard uh, exacto knife stuff, right? Um, so let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at this here. So these are the two basic handle the cheap handle styles and sizes. There's two sizes. Uh, actually, there may be more than that, but these are the two sizes that I happen to have. It's a three and a four. Uh, the three is a smaller one, and um, and uh, it takes a variety of blades. Okay, so and I'll sh and I'll show you some of the blade styles that you can get, and that's one of the advantages of scalpels is that uh, you can get a bunch of different blade varieties and they're much sharper than exacto knife blades and in fact let's go ahead and put one on here um, if you buy the sterile ones okay and they're you know they're marginally more expensive not anything uh, crazy more expensive they're even sharper than the non-sterile ones so let's uh, let's open one up here and this is a number 22 right and of course the package isn't clear so you can't see what the hell's in there so I have a little I have a little legend uh, um, you know as to what the what the heck's in there so you open it up but you don't grab a hold of it just yet. You, you hold it by the package, and then it's got this little keyhole slot here, and then you can stuff that in there without killing. Oop! You know what? I got it backwards there. So we'll do it that way there. So see, it's got a little, it's got a little groove that the blade index index is in. Then we slide it in, clink, and it drops it in. Then you pull it out, and you're off to the races. And then when you want to remove it. You just lift up on that, and then you pull it out like that, okay? But see how it notches in there, and it's really nice, right? And you can, uh, and now that's sharp as a monkey's uncle there, so quite nice. And then an another style of handle, this is a heavy-duty handle here. This is for, <laughs> you know, <laughs> slicing up, uh, you know, elephants or something like that. But you can really get a good, you can get a good grip with this one here. It's got a, a stout grip on it. All right, so I needed to change these blades anyway, so I figured I'd uh, uh, go ahead and do this. And then the uh, the super common uh, 
Um, yeah, here it is. This is a you know kind of standard catch-all do-all uh, blade here, uh, number eleven. Okay, that uh, everybody's familiar with. You know the sharp, sharply pointed one there. So let's do that. Slip it in there. And this is why, there you go, let's slot that in there. Now, actually I've found that uh, um, the, this is not the most useful blade that there is, okay? Uh, the one I really like for, for most stuff is a number 15 blade, let's see here. And let's pop one of those out and uh, you guys can get a look at it there, okay? And that's this one here. So it's a little, it's a fine tip, but it's small and curved. You can pretty much do everything with this except, uh, you know, anything that requires any reach. Okay, so, uh, and just look at that. It's, it's, it's literally, it's polished, and that is, that is a sharp blade right there. And it's pretty sturdy, it won't break. You can do minor prying with that, where this one uh, really fails out at the tip uh, uh, pretty quickly. So uh, if you're going to try this system out, uh, this is a number, uh, see now I can't, can't even remember here, number 15. So that's an 11, that's a 15, and that's a 22 there. And so the first digit goes up depending on the handle size. So uh, one is this handle and a two is this handle, if that makes sense. Anyway, Stan. Uh, buy yourself some scalpel blades, uh, sterile ones from McMaster Car sells them, uh, and they're they're pretty cheap. Uh, and man, I'll tell you, you're gonna you're gonna throw away your X-Acto knives. So one of the things that uh, that I don't know, I I'm gonna start doing more of is I don't know how you guys uh, find good channels to watch, and uh, so to me it's kind of um, I listen to people that I know and they make recommendations and. Uh, it's not like, well, you do stumble onto some accidentally, but uh, I guess what I want to do is uh, uh, plug some, some channels that I really think are deserving and uh, you should, guys should go check out if you're into this kind of stuff. So uh, for this episode, uh, that's going to be Solid Rock Machine Shop, and uh, that's run by a cool cat named Steve Barton, and uh, his sons and daughters actually help him in the shop. So uh, he's got a little shop behind his house and he does tool making stuff. And uh, Steve's a pretty cool cat. I met him in person uh, at the Summer Bash this year. That's our yearly event in Southern California. Um, so anyway, um, there's a link to Steve's channel in the, um, in the description. So go check it out. He's got some really neat tool making subjects. But uh, he uh, gave me one of his um, uh, laid boring bars uh, that he makes. And these are pretty cool. They use a little triangular insert and it's kind of double-ended. And um, um, it's just a sweet little tool. Anyway, he made a run of these and uh, he, was, he was selling some at the bash and then he was giving some away and uh, I was lucky enough to get one. So Steve, thank you very much for that. And uh, folks, uh, you want to check out, want to add a nice channel to your, uh, your watch or your, your feed, I guess, uh, go check out Steve's channel and, um, uh, and give him a shout out for me, okay? Every year at the Summer Bash, um, a lot of the, well, several of the uh, YouTube creators, they, we sponsor uh, some kind of competitions among the viewers that show up at the Bash. And uh, this year I did uh, something a little different. Um, it was kind of fun and it was, uh, it was neat to watch people do it. So let me just, I'll give you a, an idea of what, what the competition was. So what we have here, is we have just some common uh, gauge pins. And um, these all, all eight of these, they vary in diameter uh, by one thousandth of an inch, okay? So 25 microns per, uh, um, per step. And um, so what we, what we did, the idea was that um, the challenge was as quickly as you can using a, a hand tool, okay, a hand OD calipers, the idea was to to sort these, okay, uh, from smallest to largest and stick them in the racks, okay? And so what we did, or what I did, it was kind of fun because what we did was we ran the competitors head to head. So we started out like this with the, uh, with the pins just loose, okay? And we had a competitor on that side and a competitor on this side. And uh, so they were allowed to pick up 
one pin and um, and then kind of get their calipers set the way they wanted to okay and then put that pin back in and then uh, one two three go they they grab four pins a piece snatch four pins out and then uh, the idea was to sort them as quickly as possible um, just using the calipers okay so I can see that one's smaller right so I think you get the idea right okay that one's smaller than that one okay let's see what we got here okay so all right so So they only vary, okay, so they only vary a little bit. You know, I played around with this myself, and I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is reasonably challenging, right? And uh, I think this goes this way here. Yeah, okay, I think I got it. Um, you know, it's reasonably challenging. So basically they're racing the other competitor. And it was kind of like, you know, um, stages, and uh, we had eliminations, and then we ended up with with two head to head for the grand prize. And in this case, the grand prize was a uh, um, five hundred dollar uh, gift certificate from uh, Precision uh, Precision Man or All All Tool Industrial, and uh, so they could uh, uh, buy whatever they wanted from All Tool Industrial. And um, second place was, uh, so, but you know, some tools and. Uh, and raffle items that uh, that we had uh, from sponsors. So anyway, it's kind of fun. And um, so this is it's neat because this is a, a practice of your uh, using your your senses. Okay, so we have no no direct measurement here, right? Um, and using your senses and your your sense of feel to uh, to determine a, a dimensional quality, right? And it was, it was pretty shocking how fast some of these guys were, right? In fact, they, they slaughtered me. And uh, we had guys that were just literally going like this and go, oh, and then when they would rearrange it. And then they would say time, and I would pull, pull theirs aside, and I would measure them with the calipers uh, to make sure they got them in the correct order. So, uh, and if they were correct and they, they were fastest, then they advanced. So, uh, anyway, it was a lot of fun. And uh, so that's some of the... Some of the things that we do at the bash that are kind of cool, and uh, I thought you guys might get a kick out of that. So we got another idea for for next year, and uh, I'll show you a little bit about what's uh, what's going on with that, and uh, get you guys interested in uh, in that idea. All right, this is uh, kind of interesting here. You don't see these too often anymore. Um, what this is is, and I've always just called called these uh, floating reamer holders. Um, I suppose you can put kind of any tailstock type tool in them. And the idea behind it is um, many times tailstocks are not perfectly aligned. And uh, so what we don't, you know, when we're using something like a reamer or um, uh, a tool for sizing a hole, we don't want to, you know, ideally you would not rigidly hold that tube uh, on a particular axis. We want it to follow an existing hole, right? So here's, a, here's an example, um, turret lathe or something like that, or even a lathe. You drill a hole, then you bore it for accurate location, right, uh, and roundness, and then you follow with a reamer, right? Well, what we don't want is we don't want the reamer to, uh, to re-bore the hole. So if it kind of can breathe a little bit or float a little bit, it behaves better and it produces a more accurate hole. So what, that's what this tool is about here. And this one's made by Boyer Schultz. And uh, I'll, I'll show you here. You see that? It's just got a little bit of wiggle to it, okay? But it's locked up rotationally. So you put this in the tailstock, you put the shank of the tool in there, lock it down, and it kind of, you know, put some English on the, uh, or <laughs> allows some English on the tool and uh, uh, allows it to float. So, but let's take it apart because it's kind of neat inside. Um, and you can see, and it's, this, this one's well made here. Let's see if I can, there we go. Okay. So you can see it's got a key slot that's a hardened in ground surface there. And then it's got a little thrust bearing. Let's uh, take this out. And then a 
the locking element. So the thrust bearing acts on that surface and allows it to to do the little hula dancer, little uh, little float, okay? And then the other side's just kind of a, well, I gotta take the set screw out to get at it, but you can see it's another uh, bearing surface for the, um, the thrust bearing, and then the opposite keys to that, and you can see that, okay? So these are kind of neat, and uh, so if, I don't know if anybody's experienced that, I certainly have, is where you have a reamer, and you run it into a, a hole and it cuts considerably oversized because the reamer is deflecting, um, you know, on a worn tail stock or, uh, you know, something's going on. So anyway, it's kind of a neat tool. Um, floating reamer holder. This came from the uh, Hans Dreyer estate and uh, I saw it and I was like, oh, okay, I, that's kind of cool. I'll uh, put that in my pile and, uh, and play around with it a little bit. So... Okay, that's about it for this uh, meatloaf episode. I got plenty more, so I didn't want the video to get too long. So I did want to mention um, for folks that have been inquiring about t-shirts, um, I fired up a t-shirt run. Um, I'm wearing something that's representative of it. So they're uh, basically this without the, uh, the text here. It's just an Ox Tools logo on the breast pocket. Anyway, uh, there's a link in the description down below. Uh, to a Teespring campaign and that directly goes to uh, supporting the channel and helping out and then um, instead of donating or etc you get something back uh, in return so uh, anyway if you want to help out buy a t-shirt if not don't worry about it um, for those that had bought t-shirts before it's been a few years so uh, they're probably worn out about now or, or stained uh, like the rest of mine are so uh, it might be time to get a new one so Thanks for watching and hit the subscribe button and thank you very much for your support.